Okay, we're back. We're live. It's a given Tuesday. It feels like Monday, but it's Tuesday. Uh, and it's community matters because community does matter. And we have Robert Pennybacker of PBS. Uh, uh, and uh, he's going to talk about Hickey No. Good morning, Robert. Good morning, Jay. Hickey No is your program for kids, by kids, with kids, for kids. Mm -hmm. And it's really extraordinary. It's been going on a long time now, years, decades even. And you've been running it and growing it all this time. And what fun you have. And I envy you that. Mm -hmm. Uh, can you talk about what Hikino is and how it works? Uh, well, Hikino is, means can do in Hawaiian, and it's our uh, PBS Hawaii statewide student news network. We're going to hit uh, 10 years next year on the air. And basically, it's um, schools across the state, public and private and charter schools, um, students uh, create news features. Uh, we mentor them and their teachers to get the, uh, the quality of their work up to PBS standards because they need to be that, uh, of that standard to air on our air. And then we curate the separate stories into half hour episodes that air uh, every Thursday night and, and on PBS Hawaii. And then we put them online on pbshawaii.org. And it's some, um, we have 90 schools. Um, they're not all producing at the same time. At a given season, we may have about 60 schools in production. So it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a lot to deal with, a lot of juggling, but in the end, um, it's, it's really rewarding because the students work, once we get up to that quality level, is just um, incredible. There's, there's nothing like it, getting their insights on the world. So you mentioned the PBS standards, and I'm always interested in that because PBS is, um, it, it is the standard. It is the standard by which all, all things, all public television is measured, all community television is measured. What are those standards? Uh, what are they like? What categories and specifications? They get real specific. Um, uh, if you go onto the PBS website, you, you can search for them. It used to be called the Red Book. And it's just pages and pages of, uh, uh, you know, um, production quality standards, uh, technical specs that are really specific, uh, journalistic standards, fairness standards. Uh, it really covers pretty much any um, any situation that may arise where you question is does this meet the standard uh, of fairness. And, um, but after a while, it, it, it kind of becomes second nature. It, it sort of becomes a gut thing where you were, uh, me as the executive producer, I just feel, okay, is that, does that make it or not? And, and why does it not? <laughs> and let's try, to, let's try to change things so that it does. Because we don't really want to change what, what, is hap what the students are trying to express, uh, just, just the form that it takes uh, and the fairness issues so that it can air on public television. Yeah. yeah, and uh, well, I mean, the public television is really notable for those standards. I mean, I watch the news hour every day. It's uh, almost a religion with me. Um, and I feel they're fair and I feel their stuff is the best it can be. Even now in the time of COVID, uh, where they, mm -hmm. they look a lot like us right now, you and me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's all, from your home. <laughs> yeah. It's all, it's all the same now. Um, yeah, it can come down to even something as simple as uh, what a student may not think of. Let's say they're doing a, a story on a, on a business, and we love stories like that, a mom and pop business. And then at the end, they say, and they make the best shave ice in the world. Well, you can't say that on PBS. <laughs> Let's just say that they make shave ice and the people enjoy it. Um, it's just those kinds of things that, you know, um, that we just have to check off and make sure that, that, uh, they're, that they're hitting all the the right standards. So how much do the kids do and how much do you do? I mean, you mentioned curation. I don't know exactly what that is in this context. Uh, mm -hmm. the, who selects the topics? Who shapes the, um, you know, the way it's treated? Uh, and who maintains the standards? Uh, well, the, the topics um, are chosen by the students. And we've, we started that way and we found that it was a really good way to go because then uh, whatever, whatever ends up as the final product, really is reflecting what what is of interest to the students. So they pick the topics, but we have an, a, a process early on called a pitch sheet where they uh, they and their teachers, they always work with the teachers, uh, have to answer certain questions from us. And those questions just vet uh, how, how much they've thought about this be beforehand. Are they prepared to, to, to tackle the subject? 
Uh, are they going to ask the right questions? Are they going to call the right people and do the research? So um, it just helps them to um, to get get the project up and running. But the initial idea uh, is theirs, and we've never rejected a, a, a project just solely on the topic that they choose. Sometimes we go, oh boy, this this is going to be a doozy, and let's see what they come up with. But we've never said no. You, you can't do that because they they've come out and said that they want to do this. So uh, so that's the first vetting process. Then uh, it's it's uh, pretty intensive where uh, the teacher is always running the show because uh, he can is really teacher teacher centric. They're working with their students. Uh, we assign each project after it's greenlit uh, a mentor. And so we have a, a team of about, um, right now about 10 industry professionals who are either working journalists, producers, uh, directors, and they work uh, with the student's progress through the teacher. Uh, the edited pieces are uploaded to a website that, that the, um, the mentor checks. Then the mentor will give specific comments and based on those comments, uh, the teacher will ask the student to, to do another version. And that goes back and forth uh, to the point where uh, the team, the, the mentor, the teacher, and the students feel, okay, I think, I think we've got it. I think this, this is ready for PBS Hawaii. Then they submit it. And then I'm the one that vets you know, that, that final standard check uh, and give it, uh, it's approved to air. Then it gets uploaded to air. And then the curation project the process, as I mentioned, is really uh, what, what stories are ready to air and how do we fit them into an upcoming episode? And, um, and then uh, my editor uh, doesn't edit the content, doesn't edit the stories. He just places them in the show along with the transitions and the credits. And, and that's how the show is done. So really the content is really the whole process through uh, coming from the students. Yeah, it sounds like you got it down to a science now. It's all systematized. How much time do they get for a given segment? And how many are usually involved in the creation of this? How many students are involved? Well, it very, we, on a, on a regular cycle, we like to give them about two months, which sounds like a long time, but it really, we have, you have to understand it's, this is a learning process. This is part of a class. So it's not uh, like a professional situation where you say, okay, you got to get it done tomorrow. So we give them that time so they can do the back and forth with the mentor. Um, so that's, that's about the standard. We, we, we schedule in for about two months. Uh, there are other um, types of projects we have um, just to change things up. We have a challenge. Uh, we just finished one where they're only given four days. And that, uh, that's just a different, different type of discipline that, that, uh, that gets kicked into place there where they're, they're under the gun. But the good thing about that is they, it's usually over a long weekend and they focus only on that. Um, but but the, the usual uh, process is about two months. Mm. And how, how long is the segment? Uh, generally about, about a story is about three minutes. Yeah. But it's not, you know, it, it really is, the length should be how, how long the story needs to be told, you know? So you're flexible about that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. If it needs, if it needs another 20 seconds and really it's all pertinent, then we'll let it go. Uh, if it, if the story gets told in two and a half minutes, we'll let it go. So it, it kind of balances itself out and we, we end up with about eight, eight stories within a show. Sounds like the moving company of oh, days gone by. Yeah, yeah, it is sort of <laughs> that, that format, yeah. Now, it's all, it's all local style though, right? I mean, the, the topics are uh, Hawaii-based. I mean, do you ever co cover national stories? Uh, not per se. I mean, they would cover topics that would be um, of national interest, but they're doing it from a local perspective. Uh, sometimes they're really timely or, or they're really uh, ahead of their time. Uh, one example that comes to mind is, and this was quite a few years back, uh, a middle school, Waianae uh, Intermediate School, wanted to do a story on, on a transgender student of theirs, an eighth grader. And that was, um, you know, of course, uh, the transgenders have been around forever, but in terms of, you know, um, uh, them being uh, really recognized and, and accepted into schools, something quite new. And this was right around the time of the controversy uh, of the bathrooms in schools going on on the mainland. 
in North Carolina. And so, uh, so their story was, uh, was sort of ahead of its time. And the nice thing about Hikino is that it really um, uh, humanizes uh, broad national uh, story topics. And so rather than just thinking of this, this issue of what do you do about transgender students uh, within the school, you, we got to meet an actual transgender student and, and uh, you know, see that she's a real human being, just like all of us and trying to make it in school, which is, you know, tough, tough already as it is. So, um, so I, I guess what I'm saying is they, they can touch on things that are of national interest, but they're coming from a local perspective, which really makes it unique. You know, students who uh, work in the media, high school kids, or uh, well, what range do you cover? High school and also junior high school and yeah, middle you... school. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and believe it or not, and they've they've really come through. We, we've we've had about four elementary schools. So that's that really shocked me. But they, some of them can can do the work. You know, it's uh -huh. just terrific. It is. It has an effect on kids, though. You know, it has an effect on, on people in general, I would say. Mm -hmm. You know, once you're in the media, it's the, it's the bug that bit you. Um, then all mm -hmm. of a sudden, your level of awareness about the things going on around you, your level of awareness about social trends and news and events and, you know, anything of interest to the public becomes a special interest to you. Uh, mm -hmm. And it does change your life, doesn't it? It must change their lives, no? Uh, it, it does in, in, in ways that you might not think, though. Um, you know, a lot of them uh, look like they, they could certainly get into the field, that they, they have the chops. Uh, and uh, surprisingly, a lot of them, uh, when they go on to college, go into another field. But the experience they've had with Hikino has really uh, informed them to take on anything. Uh, because when you think about it, um, uh, there are very few situations like doing a, uh, a news story with, with pictures and sound out in the real world with a team um, that, uh, that forces you to make on the spot decisions that are gonna have consequences and to get along with people uh, and to interpret reality and what, what people are saying, all those skills you're really gonna need in any field. So, so they, 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 they really get their legs, uh, uh, their professional legs uh, through the Hikino process to take them into, into any field. And, Are they um, climbing all over to get into these classes? And there's a lot of competition to be involved? Um, you know, I, I think it, it's, it, it's a balance because uh, you would think that, that uh, yeah, they'd be, they'd be really you know, jumping at the opportunity, but what they soon realize is it's a, it's a lot of work. So this is not um, what, what I used to call the, we used to call the Mickey Mouse class, uh, you know, <laughs> Film 101 was a Mickey Mouse class. You just watched movies. Uh, this, this is a lot of hard work that's going to um, take up a lot of your extracurricular time. And, and the thing of it is, um, you know, uh, the time you spent on a project, uh, as it is in the real world, is, is really limitless. You really have to put in the, whatever time it takes to, to make it right. So, uh, so I think um, uh, it balances out. So there's a, there's a pretty... Uh, pretty high attrition rate of students who, right. who try and then go, oh, this isn't for me. This is too hard. Ooh, interesting. Okay, yeah. we have some questions, if you don't mind. Uh, let me pose oh. questions to you that have come in in the interim from uh, viewers. Uh, how much time do uh, mentors spend, and are they volunteers? Uh, they're not volunteers. Uh, early on, um, uh, when, uh, when our Kikino's grant funded, and early on when the grant funds were available, uh, I made the decision that uh, I wanted professionals involved in this um, project to really give it that world, real world aspect. And most of them say, you know, I would do this for free and, and I believe them, but the reality is uh, I needed to get Hikino um, pretty high in their priority list because um, the key is that these mentors have to, uh, have to respond quickly. Otherwise the whole process gets jammed up. Imagine so if you're doing something on a voluntary basis, even though your, your heart is there, uh, but you know, you have a paying gig, um, you're, you're going to have, you're going to have to deal with the paying gig first. And uh, we don't pay them a lot, but we pay them enough so that you know, it's, um, you know, somewhere at least at the, we hope the top range of their priorities. Right. Um, so that's, that, that's uh, the answer to that question. And 
uh, I like it because it, it, it then it turns it into a, a professional, uh, into the professional realm. This is a professional uh, process. They're getting paid for it. They're responsible for uh, the project. Uh, the, the time they spend really, again, um, depends on the need. Um, before we didn't, we didn't limit it. And there were times when um, a mentor would look at, uh, I think the record was about 25 rough cuts, you know, before they got it. And so, so you can imagine that <laughs> that really adds up. Um, yeah, it does, yeah. We, we've recently tried to try to limit it to, uh, to six, just so that um, the, the, the school, the students and the teacher would, would um, uh, you know, really use their, their, uh, the time they got from the mentors judiciously and say, okay, we've got, we've got two more cuts with them. We better, we better step it up. Yeah. yeah use but, the resources um, carefully. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, so the average would be, um, you know, six revisions and uh, a mentor could take a couple hours on each one. And then, you know, just, so um, it's, um, uh, I have never really counted it, but a project could take, um, uh, at least 24 hours cumulative yeah mm -hmm. well <clears throat> okay that's uh, that's very attractive actually to be a mentor uh, do you have they have uh, applicants banging at your door well they try but you know it, it really takes a special person we've tried uh professionals that that, that are really that really excel in their field and they're just not great mentors you know it, it um it's an interesting mix of of expertise and, and humbleness. Uh, you can't you can't have too much of an ego because um, you, you don't want to overwhelm the student with you know. Uh, sure. You have to remember that it's the student's story; it's not yours, and you really have to take your ego out and say, um, "Okay, how can I best help the student?" Uh, I would do it this way, but but it's not the way that they would do it. So, how can I best help them? So, um, so we're still looking, but we we've, we've seemed to have arrived at a uh, comfortable number of 10 that seem to seem to handle all, all the projects yeah it sounds it sounds just right a wise choice to pay them i think okay yeah. well we're, we're heading on to uh, the area that uh, we were going to cover pursuant um, uh, to the uh, title of the show about you know how mm -hmm. how hickey no has dealt with uh, covid and leading into that we have a viewer question that's kind of on that topic do, do you produce during the summer uh, what is your you know annual schedule because you're, uh, you know, connected to the schools, and if the schools aren't in session, are you still producing? Uh, well, uh, summer is training time, so they they go into um, training workshops. Um, this this year they're going to be online, no surprise. So summer is really the training time. Uh, then we gear up for uh, the annual uh, teachers workshop in mid August. Uh, and, and uh, that's when my staff uh, puts together a whole, whole day's worth of training for the teachers. Uh, that's been at the TV station, but this year it's likely gonna be online as well, or you know, uh, like this. So, uh, but we, then we do a summer, summer series we've done for the past few years uh, called the class of whatever the year is. We've done the class of 2018, the class of 2019, yeah, this this year will be very different, very special <laughs> sure. to the class of twenty twenty, and that's where we um we have we we get a uh, try to get a dozen um uh, seniors, you know, graduates who have really excelled in Hikino to sit around and talk about their experience, and then what they what they expect in in their lives coming up, and so that's a big summer project, uh, and uh, and we'll be doing that again, and uh, as you can guess, it'll be very different this year. Well, you so mentioned that, earlier is not. It's a good time for us to take. Yeah, well, this is this is a good year to take stock of everything, isn't it? That's you know, pursuant to oh, our discussion yeah. before the show, everybody is reconsidering everything and learning from yeah. COVID. Um, and yeah. you, you mentioned that uh, you know the the cycle is a couple months. Um, and query, you must have had shows in the pipeline, or at least segments in the pipeline. Mm -hmm. um, at the time, COVID stopped everything. And mm -hmm. I wonder, I mean, how, what are you doing with that? Um, how, how does that work now? Because your pipeline got stopped. Yeah. Well, what, what happened was um, 
uh, you know, as, as everyone, if you can think back in mid-March, everything happened really quickly. I mean, we were all watching uh, what was then not a declared a pandemic uh, really increase and, and guessing that something would have to happen and we would follow suit with other countries. Um, right at the time that, uh, that everything, you know, changed when it was announced as a pandemic, what was going on with Hikino was um, 13 Hikino schools were in Washington, D.C. for a national competition. Uh, it happens every, uh, every March. It's called STN, Student Television Network. And it's a big deal to them. It's, it's like the Super Bowl of, of student media competitions. And we were going to follow them uh, because the, the Hikino schools do really well because the, because of the experience they get all year round. And we were going to do uh, stories for uh, the news, news outlets just to show how, how well the Hawaii kids are doing. Um, my cameraman went uh, a day before me. Uh, and then the day that I was supposed to fly out was the day that, that um, it was uh, called a pandemic. It was announced that it was a pandemic. And they, and they canceled this event because the event usually draws about 3,000 students. Uh, and so I was about two hours away from my flight and I, and luckily <laughs> they, they texted me, I canceled, uh, but my cameraman and all this, the Hawaii schools, all the schools were, were stranded there. They had already flown over. Um, so this was our first, uh, first experience with dealing with uh, the students dealing with, uh, COVID-19. Uh, it sounded like a great they, opportunity, Robert. It turned it, it into was, an opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> So what, what happened, what I told my cameraman, well, you know, you're, you probably can't get a flight back, so you might as well stay and just, you know, shoot whatever is happening. And what happened was uh, the students, the, the, stu the school groups, you know, tried to get back and found that they really couldn't, you know, they couldn't get flight right back, or if they didn't, it would cost thousands of dollars. So they stayed, and a lot of them said, you know, um, there's no competition, but we're storytellers. We're going to tell. We're going to tell stories, and they went out and did stories. And my cameraman uh, followed them, interviewed them on uh, on their progress with their stories, but also just on their thoughts about what's happening in the world right now. And and we turned that into um, a documentary for PBS Hawaii uh, that that aired um, a couple months after. Well, about a month after that event it was really a quick turnaround. That's not, so that that's really, not, was not a, a, a Hickey No show. That was a, a full tilt documentary. About yeah, that. yeah, yeah. We aired it in the Hickey No slot because that would be the audience. But it was, you know, we produced it. But the, but the topic were, were Hickey No teachers and students stranded in D.C. figuring out what to do. And a lot of them um, started to have really, really um, prescient um, insights into, into the situation. Uh, and it showed their, their resilience, you know, that they said, well, uh, they were really disappointed that the uh, the competition was canceled, but they said, you know, let's make the best of it, and and they did. Uh, then things um, really amped up because we we knew uh, well right at that time. Then the governor and the mayors uh, put in the uh, you know the uh, shelter at home mandates, and and so uh, the kids got back, and uh, they actually self quarantined anyway for 14 days, as everyone should returning from a trip. So we had, we had those kids and really the whole uh, Hikino core um, uh, stuck at home. And we had uh, shows coming up. We, had our, we, we do um, rounds of six new shows uh, and then we rerun those. So we have, we have that pattern and the, the, the uh, round of new shows was coming up. We had some stories as you had mentioned in the works, but really uh, a lot of the work was yet to be done. And so we said, well, um, students are at home. Uh, they're experiencing something. Why don't we find out what they're experiencing? Why don't, why don't we have them do reflections? And okay, um, well, how are we gonna get them the equipment? Uh, that's, that's, a, that's another hurdle. Well, they all have, pretty much all of them have smartphones and the smartphone cameras are quite good now. So we created a new product um, that, was, that was to be this, really the, the starring feature of the upcoming shows called uh, Ikino Student Reflections in the Time of COVID-19. Uh, and we, we sprung into action. We said, we told the teachers, this is what we want to do. Find out which students are interested, assign them. 
we did the mentoring process different, we didn't want to um, shape their content. This was going to be their thoughts, uh, you know, uh, un, you know, unedited, really, you know, unfiltered. Um, of course, they, they had to meet, you know, they had to meet uh, decency standards. Uh, so the mentor uh, turned into more of a coach during the shooting of these. Uh, let's talk to the camera. Uh, I don't want this to feel like a scripted piece that you're memorizing. You know, it can be scripted, but we just want you to talk, talk very candidly to the camera as though the camera is your friend uh, or, or is the audience. And, uh, and they did these and they were also able to, to fill in parts of the story they told uh, with, with uh, B-roll, with bits of video and, and uh, stills. We first told them, uh, let's make these 30 seconds because 30 seconds is a, the right length for a thought. Uh, and then we soon found out now it's, they couldn't stick to 30 seconds. They had a lot to say. So it went up to a minute. Uh, but they, they were really successful and they, they became the bridges between the, the traditional Hikino stories that were in the works, the, the thread through the shows. And, uh, and frankly, they were the best parts of the show. Um, uh, it's still going on. Uh, the, the last show with new uh, student reflections airs this Thursday night. But we got a, a great cross section of um, high school students, middle school students, one elementary school student uh kids from all different uh, islands uh, different walks of life and their and their reflections their responses were, were different as well so there are no there are no limits in the sense that you it could be any student who has reflections it isn't necessarily the ones in the classes uh, that are you know doing hickey no it could be anybody they approach right uh that's that's true but they tended to be uh, those that were in hickey no already um we called them correspondents. So they really did, did want to come from a, a, a journalistic um, approach. And so I'm, I'm quite sure that uh, all the students had already had some Hikino experience or were enrolled in the, in the, in the class. Um, they, had, you know, they, they had to be good communicators and good writers. Um, but what was different for us, and it really was a breakthrough, we'd never done this before, and it really showed me that, um, uh, you know, we should have tried this a long time ago. <laughs> the, well, maybe story, you'll, you'll tr try it in the future. Yeah, well, I think we're going to continue it, yeah, because of the results. But it was the first time where that that veil of of the whole mechanism of Hiki no of of the mentors and the teacher and and the expectations that screen that all of Hiki no was filtered through, which was was a good screen, was lifted. And this was just the student, the student heart to heart, talking about what's going on in their in their in their their home right now. What's going on with themselves, with their family? Uh, you know, a lot of them were quite poignant and, and touching and and uh, and a little sad, but a lot of them were really hopeful, really optimistic. Uh, a common thing that theme that came out was, um, you know, I'm really getting to spend time with my family now, or a family spent getting time to spend with one another. That we hadn't before, uh, but there was also talk of of sacrifice. Um, parents that have to work uh, because they're they're essential uh, uh, laborers, but the child um, is at home, uh, home alone, probably with some some uh, other supervision, but away from their their uh, their actual parents. Um, so those those are. Uh, pieces of reality that, that were that were really expressed uh, throughout these, yeah. Well, you know, uh, necessity is the mother of invention and that sounds like a great thing to do going forward, to take temperature <laughs> that way, yeah. to have that candid, unfiltered, uh, or at least mostly unfiltered statement of, of state mm -hmm. of mind by these mm -hmm. kids. It's a way to stay in touch with that, the whole generation, the next, yeah. the next world, you know, our next chapter. Mm -hmm. But one thing strikes me, though, and I go back to, um, uh, you know, the, uh, the, twin, the Twin Towers, 9-11. Uh, <clears throat> you know, when, right after it happened, everybody was in a state of shock. Mm -hmm. It was an inflection point. Call it an inflection point. And everybody is very philosophical and uh, trying to get, get a, a handle on things 
when that happens. And, and COVID is likewise an inflection point where everybody is trying to find himself, get balanced uh, mm -hmm. after or in the course of a traumatic experience. And, and that's a great time to get people to give their reflections. Mm -hmm. But when things settle down and we get back to, I hate to use this word, we get back to something that feels like normal, they may not be in the same inflection point anymore. Mm -hmm. And they may not be, you know, in the same state of mind to provide you with those uh, cell phone reflections, those candid statements. What do mm -hmm. you think? Is there a way to keep that going in the future? Uh, I think so, because, uh, you know, it's, uh, things will go back to, uh, to a certain level of, of normalcy, but but the world has changed just as it has after it had after 9-11, just as it had over after Pearl Harbor. Uh, and I think, um, I think these students, um, particularly the high schoolers are, uh, are really the ones to take the temperature as we, as we continue on, as life continues on, because, uh, they're dealing with things, um, that will be changed, uh, such as college, you know, such as, uh, you know, their, their thoughts on what would be their future profession. So, um, you know, it, it really is a, is a generational thing. Uh, and, and one of the uh, student reflections that really brought this home was uh, a student from uh, Roosevelt High School was, uh, I would happen to be their mentor and we were just talking through uh, what he was gonna, what he was gonna discuss. And he said, you know, um, the other day, my mom uh, said something to me that really hit me. She said, do you realize you were born uh, a couple weeks before 9-11 and you are graduating during COVID-19. So uh, <laughs> that's the first time I had hit that. And you, so that generation is, is bookended by the two greatest crises in the 20th century. Yeah. So they are a generation of, I don't know what you're, we're gonna call them, you know, maybe the greatest generation, but they are really the ones that um, as, as children inherited one, one type of world that was turned upside down and now as adults are inheriting uh, a world turned upside down in, a, in another way. So, um, may, you know, maybe they're, um, maybe they're the best suited generation to deal with, you know, having, having grown up in a post 9-11 world. But I, I think to your point is, um, it's just gonna, it's just gonna evolve. And I think the important thing is to keep, um, keep thinking about that, you know, not not getting to uh, to be able to step back every once in a while uh, from our daily lives and and really look at how it, you know in the big picture things are changing yeah and because that's the changes for them it changes for us and and we need to yeah. talk to them we need to hear from them and you and you help us facilitate that you you make that that connection and mm -hmm. uh, we greatly appreciate your service as you know think tech feels very highly about you uh, we gave you yeah, a you. community service award back in December, and it's still good. Yeah. It's still okay. good. You can take it to the bank. <laughs> okay. that's, that's Robert Pennybacker at PBS. He, you know, thank you so much for joining us today, Robert. Oh, thank you. My pleasure. Aloha. Aloha.